Today, we learnt that Joe Biden is okay with sending cluster bombs to Ukraine. US National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan made the announcement that the US will send uh, cluster munitions to U Ukraine. Um, Joe Biden was um, approached about this and in discussions indicated that it was being done because the Ukrainians were running out of shells, running out of ammunition. So I think it's fairly conclusive now that Ukraine is having problems with ammunition and that the West is having problems in supplying them. For if that was not the case, there wouldn't be a need to resort to using cluster munitions. Now, these are, uh, these are um, explosive shells that when they explode, they contain smaller explosives, um, various types. Some of them will lay small petal type landmines and some of them are just explosive so that when they erupt, they cover an area in the exploding smaller munitions. Unfortunately, um, as we know from conflicts like Vietnam and um, countries like Cambodia, many of these don't um, explode when they are deployed or in the case of cluster mines if they're used um, they they will lay around and they will lay in the countryside for years and um, if these are deployed and it sounds like they will now be deployed by the ukrainians in ukraine then those areas of ukraine for the coming decades um, people children farmers will suffer hideous injuries and death, uh, they will lose limbs and be maimed as they stumble across these unexploded pieces of ordnance in the, in the future. Um, so there, are, there is wide-ranging opposition to the use of cluster munitions uh, throughout the world. Over 100 nations have signed on to agreements to, to ban them and outlaw them. Unfortunately, it seems that the West are getting to a point of panic where they are um, seeing the Ukrainians suffer and not achieve the outcomes, the desired outcomes of the offensive. They're unable to provide conventional um, ammunition to the levels needed and are now resorting to cluster munitions to be able to provide some level. Um, Jake Sullivan actually mentioned that this was being done as a bridge to, for a period of time until they could then get back to being able to provide um, more conventional non-clustered weapons. Um, uh, not surprisingly, Ukraine have provided the Americans with assurances that they will only be used in situations where it is um, it is assumed unlikely to cause civilian casualties. Unfortunately, as I've mentioned with many of these, the problems occur not when they are deployed. Um, the, the, the firing of these shells certainly will be fired into areas where there are no civilians because the civilians have evacuated from that area already. The fighting has been going on there for some time. No civilians are, are silly enough to remain in that area and have moved out and been forced out. However, in the future, as people return after the war and the fighting stops in those areas, people will return. People will start to clear debris and rubbish and plow fields, and this is when they will start to encounter those munitions that that remain. Um, obviously the the russians um the russians are, are very critical of this in their in their comments um on this um in fact um foreign minister uh, sergey lavrov has 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 made comments about this that this is a critical mistake by the the us um other reporting involving lavrov which is interesting at the moment um, has come out that he um, attended a series of secret meetings with some um, former national security officials in April when he was in the US there. Um, now, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russia, their spokesperson, Maria Zaharova, has come out and claimed that these stories are false. Um, 
which in itself is is interesting, as the story is that Lavrov met with some of these um, officials, and that they were they they'd asked for the meeting, and they were just to discuss possible off ramps for the U.S. and the West. Um, the meetings were held in an attempt to find ways that negotiations could be started between the U.S. and Russia. Um, um, in people, some of the people that were involved there, um, interestingly, it was Richard Haas, who is the outgoing president of the Council of Foreign Relations. The Council of Foreign Relations is a U.S. foreign policy um, think tank. It's, it's very well known. Um, he's been president there for I don't know, 15 or 20 years, for quite some time now, but he is now retiring from that role. And interestingly, he seems to now be stepping away from the globalist policies that he has um, publicised and promoted through that channel for so long seems to now perhaps be stepping away a little from the from the neocons. Um, Simplicius the Thinker has a really good article on just this topic out, out this week, which is worth having a read of. Now, if it is true and these meetings did happen, then this was an attempt to go around the Biden administration. Uh, reporting in The Guardian and CNN indicates that the Biden administration was aware of the meetings but not supportive of, supportive of them, not directing them. So this appears to show a, a, a rift in the elements of the, um, of the administration or the authorities um, in America such that some of these um, former U.S. national security officials are meeting with Lavrov, discussing things which aren't being discussed with some of uh, Biden's team. So the, the Tony Blinkens and Newlands and Sullivans and that sort of thing. And this may be an indication of a, um, a, a separate faction who are, who've had enough of the war, who aren't quite as hawkish on this and perhaps are starting to realise that there are possible future implications and problems for the US if they were to continue down this path, um, particularly particularly if we consider um, uh, the US's other major challenge at the moment, which is China, and some of the reporting that's come out there just recently um, from the Council of Foreign Relations, where they've indicated that the US at this stage, if they were to embark upon a war with China, um, would not fare well. Um, they lack the submarines to be able to take on the Chinese. Um, those submarines that they do have, many of them are in long-term maintenance um, schedules where they're out of the water, being repaired for a long time and maintained. Um, they also indicate in that report that there is a lack of long-range missiles in the Department of Defense's arsenals and that if the Americans were to attempt to uh, defend Taiwan or engage with the Chinese, that they would be in a position where they would be out, outgunned there. Um, interestingly, there was an article that I had a look at in some of the Western media. This is in um, the uh, thehill.com. Um, and it's titled, The Problem is Not Russia or China, It is Putin and Xi. And it's by Christopher Mellon. And look, it's an interesting article that I think demonstrates the um, echo chamber within which you know, many, of the, um, many of the people in the establishment in Washington must reside. There are claims in the article of increasing megalomania in both Putin and Xi, um, claims of rising threats of violence from these nations, um, and it's all blamed squarely on the Russians and the Chinese, with no concession given or, or no admission at all of any US role in any of the tensions um, that, are, that are occurring. Um, Mellon claims that the bottom line is always the same. Intolerant adversaries are willing to use violence to impose their will on others. Now, I think many people would um, consider that to be some level of projection and that you, know, you could use that term to describe the US in the way that it operates around the world. Um, but again, just an, an, an interesting article at this time when some people in the establishment are clearly 
well, it seems, if the reporting is true about Lavrov, looking for off-ramps and ways to negotiate out of the conflict. And then in the Hill, we've got these sort of comments. Um, he goes on to say that if Ukraine had voted to rejoin Russia, or if the Taiwanese people were to elect to become part of China, Americans would have no grounds to object. So because Ukraine did not vote to join Russia in its entirety, Mellon sees this as a justification for the prolonged um, destruction of the Ukrainian state via the continued supply of weapons, including now um, cluster munitions we see. Um, also, uh, with a newly announced $800 million aid package, um, the US are providing in this round of, of military aid um, another 32 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles, 32 striker armour personnel carriers. Now, these are the vehicles that we saw at the start of June. Um, some of these suffering tremendous losses in the, in the minefields around the area the Russians now refer to as Bradley Square, up on the Varemka Ledge, in the Orokov area. Um, the, the package includes 31 155mm howitzers uh, ammunition for the Patriot and HIMARS systems. Um, the um, 105mm and 155mm ammunition and 28 million rounds of small arms ammunition. Um, interestingly, on the topic of the cluster munitions, video has surfaced on social media today of former White House spokesperson uh, Jen Psaki um, being asked at that stage about um, a alleged Russian use of cluster munitions um, and that if she thought that that would be a war crime and in that, in that video she says that, well, yes, it would be likely that it would be a war crime if, if um, Russia was using cluster munitions. I, um, I wonder if her position um, on cluster munitions extends to the US in the same regard, if she considers that to be a war crime, if the, um, if the US and the Ukrainians do begin to deploy these across Ukraine. Um, globally, there's, um, there's, there's quite a bit going on. Um, uh, Yuval Harari, who's a spokes or an advisor to Klaus Schwab of the um, World Economic Forum, he's been quoted in an interview today as asking, what do we need humans for? At the moment, our best solution is to keep them happy with drugs and computer games. I'm sure a lot of people do enjoy their drugs and computer games, but this is, I think, you know, um, quite a big statement. Um, for someone to be claiming that globally, you know, what do we need humans for? Perhaps we should just be moderating them and medicating them with drugs and, and computer games. Um, there seems to be quite a bit of pushback, I think, since the, um, since the um, pandemic over the last couple of years. Or people's awareness of the World Economic Forum and what their goals might be have grown. Prior to sort of 2019, I wasn't aware of many people who were familiar or aware of the World Economic Forum. I think that has now changed. Um, I think in particular, given the close ties that leaders such as Justin Trudeau of Canada, um, former uh, Prime Minister of New Zealand, uh, Jacinda Ardern, being young um, World Economic Forum leaders, um, uh, interesting, um, Mark Root of the um, the Prime Minister of the um, Dutch of the Netherlands, the Dutch government, he's a, today announced his resignation um, after a, uh, he, he's, he's had some challenges, um, clearly he's taken a, an, author an authoritarian role and um, seems to be quite aligned with World Economic Forum policies. He has had some major struggles as he's tried to um, reduce the level of farms within the Netherlands. Now, this is a really a nonsensical move. The Dutch farmers are well known to be some of the best farmers on the planet. Um, stopping them from having land to farm is not a good idea. 
Uh, anyhow, that has been a challenge and that's caused big problems uh, in the Netherlands over the last year or so. So his coalition um, of four parties that he, he has led, that coalition, that has just disbanded in the last day or so and he's now announced his resignation. So, yeah, perhaps some struggles there for the World Economic Forum um, starting starting to appear, some of their policies being pushed back against, which I think is probably a good thing. Um We've got the NATO summit coming up in Vilnius on the 11th and 12th of July, so only a few days away, within a week. Um, images have emerged of uh, Patriot air defence missile systems being deployed in uh, in Vilnius. Um, we've still got Stoltenberg as the uh, Secretary General in that role. Uh, NATO um, ha ha seem to have announced that they won't be um, replacing him at this stage. They're unable to find someone. There was... Um, uh, ben Wallace was going to be a British um, candidate for the role, although um, reporting indicates that the Biden administration stopped that going ahead, um, primarily because they felt that he was too eager to get to pushing the F-16 boat out. Um, I think the Americans are a little bit cagey about getting F-16s into the fight. And they saw what had happened to the Leopards on their first day in action and to the Strikers, which has been bad publicity for them in terms of um, the capabilities and durability of those weapons. I think they recognise now that with Russian air defence operating as well as it seems to be, that taking F-16s into this fight would rapidly have um, newspaper headlines talking about F-16s being shot down. Um, now, Ben Wallace, being British, uh, um, uh, from the UK, uh, perhaps not quite as concerned about um, the negative press of the F-16s, but more keen to be seen to being warmongering and getting them into the fight. Anyhow, that apparently led to Biden um, saying no to his, to his chances there. And, um, and yeah, so that's left Stoltenberg in, in place there. Um, in terms of uh, Ukraine and this NATO summit, the word seems to be that Ukraine will not be given access to NATO until after the war. Uh, that position seems to still be holding. Instead, what is appearing likely is that um, the US may look to offer some sort of Israel-like security guarantee for Ukraine. Um, what that would mean would be broad military support would continue, so the supply of material and um, training, equipment, um, um, ammunition, um, um, perhaps you know, sort of logistical training and support, um, information support, satellite imagery, and that sort of thing would all be provided, but without direct intervention of the US uh, in Ukraine. So much more similar to what we've got now, but there would perhaps might be some um, some time frames tied to that to give Ukraine some confidence that they will have ongoing support. Pardon me, past this offensive. Um, now, talking about the offensive, look, progress really does seem to have ground to a, um, a standstill for the Ukrainians in terms of the, the offensive. Um, in Kleshevka, which is in uh, the Donetsk area um, and uh, just, uh, just near Artyomsk, uh, Artyomsk um, is the, the, the city which has been fought over for months, which the Ukrainians refer to as Bakhmut. Um, Russian reporting is claiming that the positions taken by Ukraine over the last week around Kleshevka, where there's been heavy fighting, it's on the southern flank of the Bakhmut region, um, that those Russian positions that were lost have been regained, is, is the reporting out of there. In, in Kherson, we've had... Um, um, I struggle to understand why, but we've had ongoing attempts by the Ukrainians to insert forces uh, into the, the Dakas on the uh, eastern side of the um, Dnieper River uh, at the Antonovsky Bridge, um, where the Ukrainians have established a bridgehead over the last couple of weeks, but which has been... Um, 
primarily um, neutralized by Russian, um, Russian forces. There are reports that there are ongoing attempts by Ukrainians to insert troops into that area near the bridge um, and that they may be holding some small positions in the houses or duckers around there. However, they seem unable to be um, capable of advancing and pushing past that or of reinforcing themselves with any heavy equipment, any armour um, at this stage. Again, um, this is a Kherson region. Now, after all of the claims in the Western media of the big success that occurred there last year when the Russians left the West Bank of Kherson um, and withdrew to the East Bank. Um, obviously, in a lot of uh, Ukrainian um, social media, um, U Ukrainian reports treat that as a large victory for Ukraine. But in terms of the battle and what happened, it really does appear to be more of a Russian withdrawal, a, a considered, measured Russian withdrawal, a desire to get their troops to the east bank of the Dnieper before something like the um, Novokakhovka Dam could be um, destroyed as it was destroyed, flooding the area, which would have cut off the Russian troops and left them isolated without the ability to be supported. So given there's been all of this press in the West about the Kherson offensive for Ukraine being such a success, um, with it having stopped at the Dnieper, I think perhaps this is part of Zelensky's plan to try to be able to go to Vilnius with ideally having established a solid foothold in Kherson to say, look, we've even taken Kherson beyond the Dnieper. Um, unfortunately, with only a couple of days to go, it doesn't look like that is going to be achieved. Um, another area in Donetsk, we're moving back to Donetsk, um, Avdiivka. There are reports there of um, Russian Fab 500, these are big 500 kilogram guided bombs, um, having been deployed against a, an industrial coke plant there. So um, the, uh, the reporting is that Ukrainians have been using this large industrial building as a as a, a, a staging area and a um, storage area for vehicles and heavy equipment um, to be able to store them underground in this heavily, heavy concrete um, uh, industrial complex. Um, now reports are indicating that there may have been some targeted bomb strikes um, in some of the areas of this coke plant which may have caused the um, detonation of ammunition dumps and will have forced the Ukrainians to now redeploy some of those forces to scatter some of those resources to other areas. Um, also, it was considered that this stronghold was a command centre for some of the brigades in the area around Avdiivka, and so that those command posts will also now have been, um, if, not, if not destroyed, um, damaged, and uh, the Ukrainians possibly forced to find other locations around there. So this for the Russians is, you know, will be um, something that they will have been looking for because the Ukrainian um, offensive has been very strong around this area of Avdiivka up to um, Achomas Bakhmut. There has been a lot of fighting there. Again, the um, because of the size of the fighting in Bakhmut over the last nine months, it would be a large PR victory for Zelensky if he could go to Vilnius and claim that. You know, Ukrainians now control Bakhmut again. Um, also, but again, this seems unlikely given the reporting that's coming out and even looking at things like both the Ukrainian um, UA Live maps and Rybar's map reporting. You know, they're all indicating very similar sort of things. There have been some pushes by the Ukrainians, some some ground made, but it looks like some of that has now been reclaimed by the by the Russians. Um, in um, Piatikatki in the Zaporozhye region, so this is just to the east of the big um, water area of Zaporozhye, of the river there, um, Russian reports that the 128th Brigade of the Ukrainian Armed Forces 
uh, retreated from the settlement today under heavy artillery fire. Now, Piatikatki has been an area which seems to have gone backwards and forwards between Russian and Ukrainian control a number of times over the last um, last couple of weeks and was for a period of time there being claimed as being completely under Ukrainian control. So this reporting um, is now indicating that the Ukrainians that there were there holding Piatikatki, um, Piatikatki uh, may now have been forced out of the area. So again, this is not looking good for Zelensky going to Vilnius because that was looking at one stage like being an area where Ukrainian advances may have been achieved and sustained if they've now been pushed back out of that settlement. That's one less um, area of success that he would be able to um, claim. Um, um, also some reporting I saw today is indications that the Russians, um, while they are fighting off the Ukrainian offensive, are also reinforcing their defensive lines through the Zaporozhia and Donetsk region. So while they already have some very well-established um, defensive lines, apparently satellite imagery has shown that work is continuing and they are extending um, and advancing and deepening those now that is going to be um bad news for the ukrainians who have really in this offensive only been able to operate in what was prior to the offensive the the sort of the a gray zone in terms of advances they haven't made it to the um well established stronger russian defense lines yet um and the, the Ukrainians, now it's being reported that they have had to make a change in tactics. And it's being referred to now as mosquito attacks, which is due to the minefields and the impacts that was having against the um, infantry fighting vehicles and tanks and armoured personnel carriers. They are now um, using small assault squads of small numbers of men, um, unprotected by armour, getting them to advance and the tactic seems to be that they are relying on the fact that the Russians appear to be um, more averse to losing manpower over some of these um, frontline positions. And so the Russians will fall back. Um, the Ukrainians are then using these small groups of men to advance on Russian positions, suffering heavy losses. Uh, the, the Russians then will retreat, and so the Ukrainians are able to claim the positions. However, once the Russian um, forces retreat, those positions come under sustained heavy Russian artillery, and again, the uh, Ukrainians um, are suffering very heavy losses there. The, while there have been reports talked about throughout this conflict of Russians sending human wave attacks, and um, I don't think there's been any real evidence of that. This reporting today, talking about this um, and looking at some of the accompanying photographs and footage, uh, really quite disturbing and saddening footage of groups of Ukrainian soldiers in trenches appearing to be dead, um, some video footage of what appeared to be almost exactly this, um, an abandoned Russian trench, a group of six or seven Ukrainian soldiers advancing, running into the trench as soon as they're getting into the trench, um, explosives which had been wired into the trench by the Russians were detonated and you would imagine that there were there were casualties in in, in that given the in the footage. So, yeah, this this almost appears to be that human wave tactic that has been talked about. You know, men, small groups of men running forward, advancing forward, unsupported by uh, by armor because the armor is struggling to get through minefields. Um. Yeah, it's, it's not it's not um good if the Russians. Uh, well, sorry, for the Ukrainians, it's not good if the Russians are extending and deepening their defences. Um, just one couple of things. Um, there's long been talk of the game changer coming to this conflict. There was talks of um, 
the um, HIMARS rocket system being a game changer and the Stingers being a game changer and man pads and Patriot air defence systems and then Leopards and Strikers and Bradleys um, and F-16s. However, in some analysis that's been done, what really does appear to have been the game changer in this conflict is the FPV drones. Those small to medium size, often just um, almost you know, consumer grade drones where the pilot is able to put on a pair of goggles or use an iPad type device and view from a camera mounted on the drone itself view where it is, fly it, and with some sort of munition um, attached to the bottom of it. This has changed the battlefield dramatically in that it allows soldiers now to take out a piece of armour. It's like to take out a tank or to take out an infantry fighting vehicle or an armoured personnel carrier from a distance while safely contained within a trench some distance away. And to be able to do this multiple times in a day, over and over and over. Um, that combined with the sighting and reconnaissance abilities of drones, so ones not lumbered down by um, the weight of munitions, but sent out to view an area and communicate back reconnaissance about where the enemy troops are, means that advances can be identified you know, well before they get in range of, of an attack. So the, the drone warfare really does seem to be the game changer and developments in that area I think will have a big impact upon the future nature of battle. You know, the, the side that can place more men with these FPV drones, uh, the side that has the better counter electronic warfare measures to enable those drones to fly and reach the enemy um, armour and en en enemy locations will, will have the advantage. Um, last thing, just an interesting thing I saw today, the story that never dies, Evgeny Prigozhin, the, um, the ex-titular head of the Wagner forces. Um, I saw some video today which reportedly was the flight logs of his private jet um, over the last couple of weeks since the um, insurgency w was quashed. And if we assume that it is Prigozhin who's been flying in the jet, then there has been a lot of activity and travel between Minsk and Moscow, um, Rostov-on-Don, where the military um, sort of headquarters for this special military operation is based, um, back to Moscow, St. Petersburg, um, Minsk again. So I don't know if he, if um, Prigozhin is in this plane, but it is apparently his uh, private jet. Um, if he is, then he certainly doesn't seem to be in under any sort of strict house arrest at this stage so we'll keep watching and just see what happens there anyhow if you've enjoyed this please subscribe um i'll be back online with something in the next day or so thanks mm -hmm.